Stadium in Philadelphia. It's ESPN Sunday Night Baseball. Tonight, the St. Louis Cardinals and 3.30 hitter Greg Jeffries take on the Phillies and red-hot Lenny Dykstra. It's the Sunday Night Baseball Game of the Week. Veterans Stadium tonight ESPN Sunday Night Baseball comes to the venue where the wildest World Series game in history was played the Phillies and the Cardinals hoping to meet here tonight but right now the tarp is covering the infield they've got thunder showers it's 79 degrees but the forecast is for more thunderstorms here so we will see everyone I'm John Miller along with Joe Morgan we're smiling but inside we're hurting because of the rain here we're hoping to get this ball game in now we will have baseball for you tonight one way or the other standing by in Texas at the ballpark in Arlington we've got the Kansas City Royals David Cohn going for his 10th win against the Texas Rangers down there the Red Hot Rangers so we'll have that ball game for you and hopefully we'll be able to get back here and get this one started as well so be with us one way or the other we know the Phillies a ball club has been struggling Joe but still a ball club has got all all those familiar faces like Dykstra, Kruk, and Dalton. Well, Lenny Dykstra is having another outstanding year. He has proven that he is the best leadoff hitter in baseball. But the guy for me is Darren Dalton. He has been a stabilizing influence in the lineup as well. This is last night's ball game. He had a home run. But he is not only a leader in the batting order, he is the team leader off the field. He's the guy that's most respected in that Philly club duck. All right. Now, the St. Louis Cardinals are right in the thick of things in the newly formed National League Central. I Ozzie Smith, as you would expect, and a hope on a national telecast. He's in there tonight. And Greg Jeffries, the first baseman, had such a great year last year, and he's doing it again. He's hitting 330. Last night hit a big three-run homer in a game that they won by three right off the right field foul pole. But the Cardinals, besides uh, Jeffries, got a lot of guys really underperforming right now, Joe. Well, you're right. Jeffries and Langford are the two hot Cardinals, but they have Mark Witten, Todd Zeal, Brian Jordan, and Bernard Gilkey. Two of these four are going to have to get hot in order for the Cardinals to win. They're not going to win it with their pitching. They need some more offense. All right, so we've got a great matchup scheduled here. Danny Jackson, 7-1. Bob Tewksbury, 8-4. But we're waiting for the weather to break. So stay tuned now. We're going to be taking you shortly to Texas. David Cohn going for his 10th win, facing Canseco, Gonzalez, Will Clark, and those Rangers. And welcome back to Veterans Stadium here in Philadelphia. And despite the thunderstorms, despite the lateness of the hour with the work day tomorrow, as you can see, a huge crowd is gathering here at the Vet to watch the National League champion Philadelphia Phillies and the St. Louis Cardinals. In the National League Central, the newly formed Central Division, the St. Louis Cardinals are out of the thick of things. Cincinnati lost today, Houston lost, and there are the Cardinals. They can move within just two games of first place. Cincinnati with a win here tonight, which would also give them three out of four over the Phillies at the vet this weekend. Meanwhile, in the National League East, the Braves won, the Expos lost, the Expos are three games out, and there are the Phillies. They're struggling with a win tonight. They would be 10 games out, but again, remember, Remember, you don't have to finish first necessarily to go to a postseason. They would be seven games out of a wild card berth at this point. I'm John Miller along with Joe Morgan. We've waited out the rain. And Joe, we've gotten information that the rain is gone. We don't have to worry about it. So we're going to get this ball game in without any kind of incident. Now, we've got a great matchup tonight. Danny Jackson, 7-1. and one. Again, Bob Tewksbury, an eight-game winner going for the Cardinals. Well, I think Danny Jackson has really been helped by his change up this year. He's gone to the circle change which has really helped him. In the past, he's thrown basically fastball and a slider. Now he throws a sinker and not the regular fastball to go along with the changeup, and that has made him very successful so far. He's 7-1. 
and he has been uh, something special. And Johnny Padres, who himself threw one of the great changeups uh, that anybody ever threw, and really knows how to teach that pitch. And uh, Darren Dalton was telling me that he threw it occasionally last year, and he hasn't really truly mastered it this year. But he'll throw it at almost any time. Well, Darren Dalton knows how to work the pitchers, as I've said before. I am really, I, I think Darren Dalton is one of the most underrated players in all of baseball because not only is he a team leader on this ball club, but he has to also call the pitches for a beleaguered staff this year. And I think he's really done a great job with Danny Jackson. All right, now Jackson tonight, seven and one, and Bob Tewksbury, an eight-game winner, and he's fallen upon hard times lately. But nonetheless, when he's on, he can be as tough as anybody. Well, Bob Tewksbury needs all four of his pitches to be effective. He has been getting over only two or three of them over lately. He throws a fastball, changeup, curveball, and a slider. So he needs all of those pitches to be successful because he does throw a lot of strikes. And any time he gets too much of the plate, he gets hurt. All right, so we've got the Phillies and the Cardinals coming up here from the vet. And uh, we've got Danny Jackson now having concluded his warm-ups, walking in with Johnny Padres, the pitching coach out there. And uh, so we are just... A couple of minutes away from getting started here, the Phillies and uh, the St. Louis Cardinals. And uh, just a few minutes ago, we couldn't see downtown from here. So heavy was the rain. The Philadelphia Phillies are checking the field here at Veterans Stadium. I'm John Miller along with Joe Morgan. We're just moments away from getting started. There's Joe Torrey. His ball club has not hit well so far, and yet still they're in the thick of things in the central. Here's the batting order now for Torrey's Cardinals. It will be Bernard Gilkey left field. Geronimo Pena second base. Greg Jeffries, who is hitting at first base. Todd Zeal hitting cleanup. He is not hitting. Mark Witten recently back from the disabled list. Brian Jordan in center giving Langford the night off. Terry McGregor. Griff, the catcher, giving Pagnazzi the night off. The Wizard, Ozzy, is at short, and Bob Tewksbury bats ninth. On the mound, Danny Jackson, seven wins, and a loss for the Philadelphia Phillies with a 3.12 earned run average. And uh, we asked Danny Jackson maybe to give us a rundown on his repertoire of pitches. This is a two-seamer right here. I throw down away from a right-handed hitter. And this is a four-seamer where I run it in to a right-handed hitter. And then uh, change-ups right here. Circle change that everybody throws nowadays. And then uh, my slider's right here from where I throw my slider. Well, as Jackson mentioned, the pitch of the early 90s was a split-fingered fastball. Most pitchers tried to throw it. I believe now you're going to see more and more pitchers throw the changeup because it becomes more effective when pitch hitters are swinging from their heels and trying to hit the ball out of the ballpark. And that changeup has made him a much better pitcher this year. And let's take a look at the Phillies defensively. And Duran Dalton is the key not only to their team offensively but defensively as well. He's the guy that has to make all the calls. And, of course, he has made a lot of different changes this year because they've had a different pitching staff than they thought they were going to have rotation-wise at the beginning of the season. He has had to adjust to each and every pitcher. And he's done a great job. And the throw goes down to second base to Mickey Morandini. And we're ready to get started here. Bernard Gilkey will stride to the plate. Danny Jackson. He has really and a savior for the Phillies this year. The Phillies five-man rotation, which pitched so effectively last year. Well, right now, Danny Jackson is the only one of the five still pitching for the Phillies. Here's Bernard Gilkey hitting 259, four homers, 24 battered in, a lot of speed. But if he was going normally, he'd be hitting well over 300 right now. So he's one of the guys slumping. John, one other thing to look for in this ball game is the defense of the Phillies. They have allowed more unearned runs than any other team in the league, and their defense has always been suspect. Even last year at the beginning of the season, they made a lot of errors. But you can't do that when your pitching staff is struggling. Of course, Danny Jackson has pitched well and been able to pitch out of trouble, but take a look at their defense early, and we'll be able to see how they're going to play tonight. Two balls and a strike now. You can see that 40 unearned runs allowed by the Phillies so far. And ball three. Aronimo Pena is on deck. Jackson was uh, one of the very fine uh, starting rotation members for the Phillies last year. Into right center field, into the alleyway. 
This one will go to the wall. Dykstra over to play the carom, and Gilkey pulls up in second with a double. Mentioned Bernard Gilk is a very good hitter, and the count was three and one. He didn't get to swing three and oh, that was three and one. And he found the gap in right center field. But to be a good hitter against left handed pitching, if you're right handed, you need to go a little bit that way because the ball tails away. See, it's over the outside part of the plate, and he just goes that way into right center field. And he finds the gap. And that's one of the reasons he has been a 300 hitter the last couple of years because he does hit the ball all over the park. Yoki at second. Here is Geronimo Pena. His job is surely to get Yoki over to third base here. Should be. Now, Pena, so hit batting average, only 208. The Cardinals have not been getting any production out of second base this year, whether it be Pena or Luis Alisea. Both of them have really struggled. There's the puck. Third base side of beauty. Nobody goes to get it. Jackson then seeing that. The third baseman Batiste was not coming in. Tried to reverse his field and he slipped and fell. Well, the one thing you have to do if you're the third baseman, you have to make sure you get one out someplace. If you're not completely sure that the pitcher is going to be able to field the ball, you have to charge it and take it. Let's see how quickly he takes back, goes back to third. Well, he takes two steps in. Now he stops and reverses his field. But you can see Jackson actually was off to the first base side. So he really didn't have any chance to get the ball. Baptiste has to come and get that ball. You have to make sure of one. Now here is Jeffries. Switch hitter batting right-handed. 330 average. High in the air to right field. Eisenreich. And that ball took off on him. Easily coming in to score is Gilkey. Pena back to first. Turned into a nice play by Eisenreich as the Cardinals take a one nothing lead. Well, Eisenreich started drifting on the ball and the ball continued to travel so he ended up having to make a tough catch. Ball's out toward the end of the bat and you can see that he really just did. I think he needed to get back a little quicker but he made a good play on the ball anyway. Here now is Todd Zeal, the key man for this Cardinal club. He's the cleanup hitter, but only a 235 batting average for Zeal. He really became the RBI man they had hoped last year. Dalton drops it, but the runner holds it first. But Zeal finished up last year with 103 runs batted in, 277 average. So he's nowhere close to that kind of production so far this year. have so many things that have gone wrong for them so far you wonder exactly how they've been able to stay close in that central division which is a very high for a ball two and all the count I mean the Cardinals are not scoring many runs just a little over four runs per game and their earned run average is almost five runs per game as a staff and yet they have a record of better than 500 and they can pull it within two games of first place with a win here tonight One in for the Cardinals here in the first inning. Neal has never hit well against Jackson, as you can see. A lot of guys have not hit well against Jackson. Well, there's a good pitch, the ball moving away from Zeal, and that's what left-handers do well anyway. Their fastball tails away. And now you see that's the changeup, and it is going away from Zeal, and Zeal way out in front. Good pitch by Jackson. Two and two now. Truck on the back at first with Pena. So they get two here. There's one. And the dirt pulled out by Truck double play. Morandini's relay of Kruk was in the dirt and wide, and Kruk stretched out and played the short hop to get the double play. Six to four to three. Good play by Stalker to get the ball to Morandini in good shape, but he doesn't make a good throw to first. And watch, the throw is chest high where you want it. Perfect. 
Morandini's throw is just off to the outfield side, but good scoop there by Crook, and the Phillies get out of trouble. Cardinals have the lead, and uh, now Jim Fregosi's uh, ball club will be coming to bat here against Bob Tewksbury. Fregosi's club, they've hit pretty well, nearly five runs per game. Among the top five in the National League in that category, middle of the league for team batting average. And that's even though they've had some injury problems. Len Dykstra leads it off, and uh, he's averaging nearly a run per game. Mickey Morandini, second base. John Crook, when he's played, he's hit, hitting 311. Darren Dalton, the catcher, 44 RBIs. Another big season in the offing. Jim Eisenreich hitting 312. Milt Thompson in left field hitting 283. Kim Batiste at third base. Kevin Stocker, the rookie who just electrified the city here in the second half of last year. And then Danny Jackson is the pitcher hitting ninth. And there's Bob Tewksbury, who's the first seven-game winner in the Major Leagues this year. He's cooled off considerably of late. Look at that earned run average, very high. He is eight and four. He throws a wide variety of pitches, and so we asked him to demonstrate his pitches for us. This is uh, my sinker, two-seam fastball. This is my four-seam fastball or cut fastball that I'll use away from the right-handers and into the left-handers. My changeup is the uh, circle change. My curveball is a four-seam curveball that comes out of my hand this way. This is the uh, slider, and this is the snail ball. I don't throw that, though. <laughs> and that snail ball is probably the toughest to hit of all. <laughs> I'm sorry he doesn't throw it, you know? Yeah. Bob Tewksbury. And he, of course, relies on his control. He's not who can overpower anybody. Well, let's take a look at the defense. And because we will not see him much longer, Ozzy Smith has had 13 gold gloves presented to him. And he makes plays all over the field. We'll take a look at one. This is kind of routine for Ozzy. It's a great play for most shortstops. But for Ozzy Smith, we've seen him do that for about the last 15 years. He's only won 13 gold gloves. He has always been a good defensive shortstop. And that was in a game this year, back in May, against the New York Mets. He is struggling now. Here's Dykstra. Right center field. Jordan. And there is one away. Just like that, Dykstra retired. That's interesting, John. Dykstra normally takes some pitches at the beginning of the ball game, but he knows taking a lot of pitches against Tewksbury is futile, so he looks it for the first fastball, he gets it, and he tries to hammer it, but he didn't get enough of it. And brings up Mickey Morandini. Morandini hitting 276, no homers, nine runs battered in. Shows Buck takes a called strike. Jerry Crawford, he won't play up prior tonight. One to nothing, the Cardinals leading as we play the last of the first. dugout. John, oh, two. John, I was looking at today's paper where they list all the averages at the end of the week. And I went through and I looked for some players that did not have home runs. There are only three in the National League. There are only two now. Delano DeShields, Chucky Carr, and Mickey Morandi. Uh, of the okay, regular. Had enough advance yeah, to qualify, qualify for, for my benefit. And I found that interesting because, I, you know, so many home runs have been hit this year that only three of the almost regulars without the home run. We'll call the Professor Morgan batting leaders from here on. <laughs> Unassisted put out there for Jeffries at first base. Two men down. Take a look at this fastball on the inside part of the plate right on the corner, maybe a little off, and they jams Morandini, breaks his back. And that's what Tewksbury does. He'll throw you a lot of change-ups away, and then his fastball looks much quicker than it really is when he comes inside. Good pitch there. Well, now here's John Crook. And, of course, John Crook's life has changed dramatically since last we saw him in October. He's first ball swinging as well. And Pena throws him out. So the Phillies in the first, we hardly saw him. one nothing Cardinals. Six pitches for Tewksbury. Sunday night baseball from Philadelphia. Cardinals won, the Phillies nothing. We go to the last of the second. This is a, a beginning of...
close coverage of the Phillies. John, take a look at Terry McGriff at first base in the middle of your screen now. It's two outs. He should be running full speed. He is not running. You know, a lot of things have been blamed. The Cardinals have blamed their uh, lack of success this year on hitting. But they've also had a lot of poor base running mistakes. They've made a lot of mistakes on the bases so far this season as well. And talking to the coaches, that's one of the things that's really bothered. Well, McGriff didn't know how many, how many outs. He didn't know how many outs there were. There is Darren Dalton. Two down, you crack of the bat, you run as hard as you can. Exactly. If, if Dykeson drops the ball, you should be able to almost score. Here's Dalton. And uh, he is, as you mentioned, at the head of the telecast, become the, the real leader of this club. And he's a tough guy. He plays every day. They talked about reducing his workload this year. Hasn't happened. Still in there every day. Dalton with 13 homers, 44 runs batted in. He drove in 105 runs last year, 109 the year before. Hustling up the line and made it close. It was another good pitch by Tewksbury. The breaking ball down and away at fooled Dalton. He thought it was a regular speed breaking ball, but it was a little slower one. He got out in front, hit it off the end of the bat. One down here is Jim Eisenreich. Eisenreich. Hitting 312, one home run, 18 driven in. And uh, Jim Fregosi's favorite player. The slider misses down and in says that Eisenreich is a guy who just doesn't make mistakes out there. Always cognizant of the game situation. Always hustles everything out. And the Fregosi says, hey, don't be fooled by our record. This club still hustles everything. Which for him was the trademark of last year's club. Not that they had a bunch of characters in the team, but that they just played hard every single day. Well, the media made them a bunch of characters. You know, they said they're compared to the truck driver. But for me, the thing that the Phillies was their hard play. They were a hard-nosed team. They hustled all the time, and they weren't afraid of knocking people over at second base. They played the game the way it was supposed to be played. That's a strike. Now, this is always a, a major story. Anytime Tewksbury has three balls on a count, because he hardly ever walks anybody. He walked 20 all of last year. And he gives up the hit this time. First hit for the Phillies. Eisenreich has it. Well, that's one of the things that Tewksbury does. He will give up a base hit before he walks someone. And he gave up more hits than anyone in the league last year. But that's because on three and one pitches, he will throw strikes. Three and one, you see the target right in the middle of the plate. Wasn't a bad pitch. The ball sunk away from Eisenreich, but he did a good job of hitting it to the center field. If he'd have tried to pull that ball, he probably would have gotten a ground ball to second base. Now, Mel Thompson, one of the uh, Phillies role players. 283, three homers, 21 battered in. Right over the middle, into center field. Base hit. Eisenreich's going to try for third. Jordan Slow. He's in there. Well, we talked about base running. There's an example of good base running there by Eisenreich. He made up his mind about 10 feet from second base that he was going to go. He turned the bag and kept going. Jordan, with a good throw, had a shot at him. That's a slider that's bounded right back through the middle. Now, Jordan is really kind of trotting in. He's not charging that ball as quickly as he should. Now, watch. Eisenreich makes up his mind. He's going to force the action right there. A good throw probably would have made it a very close play, but not a good throw from Jordan in center field. Now, this is base camp. This is Eisenreich coming in to our eyes right there in second base. See him catching the location of uh, Jordan as he fielded the ball in center as he got near the back. Here's Batiste. Curveball in there. Call strike one. You know, one of the big plays in that first inning when the Cardinals scored a run was Batiste failing to come in to field that bunt. Pena. Batiste, the chance to atone for that. He's hitting 221. And watch him in bag practice. He was taking everything to right field. Did it hit him? No, it hit the bat. And his first two approaches to the pitches looked like he was trying to go the other way. And Tewksbury threw that pitch way inside. 
watch him see starts in and it's a foul ball according to Jerry Crawford. There you can see it off the bat and off the catcher. Now, even when Tewksbury doesn't throw a strike he gets a strike and that is control. Oh and to the count. What is it first and third one out. Hard goes ahead by one. One ball and two strikes. Eisenreich hit a single to center with one out. He's at third base. Milt Thompson bounced to single to center. He's at first being held in the bag by Greg Jeffries, who's also talking his ear off over there. One of these guys don't know how many outs there are, Joe. Well, that'll get the run home deep into center field. Jordan coming in to score is Eisenreich. Batiste with the RBI. It's all tied up. Tewksbury feels that he's a lot more effective a lot of times against left-handed hitters in these situations because of the changeup. But the changeup is lost on right-handers. This pitch gets a lot of the plate. You could see that McGriff was set up way off the plate outside. That pitch got a lot of the plate, and Batiste was able to get enough of it to drive in the run. So not a good pitch there from Tewksbury when you were hitting the count 0-2. Now here's the switch hitting Kevin Stocker, 237 average. Just back from the disabled list here fairly uh, recently. He wasn't even in the big leagues at this time last year. He came up to the club around the All-Star break. Solidified their infield defense, which is all they wanted him to do. But he did more than that. He hit 324 in the second half of the year. And this club got the uh, just what they needed when Stocker came up. There's a phrase you do not hear much anymore, punch and Judy hitter. That means a guy hits a lot of singles and slaps the ball the other way. You don't have those types of hitters much anymore because most people are swinging harder with a thin or handle bat. But Stocker kind of reminds me of, of people who the term was coined for, and that's guys who hold the bat tight to their body and just kind of slap the ball around and get base hits. Well, you got 20 singles, two doubles. Now he didn't. He wasn't on your list of no home runs. Well, he he's been off. He's been on disabled. He doesn't have nothing bad. <laughs> One to one the score here, last of the second. No Thompson first base. Now Thompson's got pretty good speed. He can steal a base if you don't keep a close eye. The outside corner. One ball, one strike to Stocker. And the funny thing about that list, John, Moran Dini led the Phillies in home runs in spring training. He hit a lot of home runs in spring training, and he doesn't have one. Morandini. Morandini hit a grand slam in a big ball game with the Phillies last year that won it in the bottom of the ninth inning. I asked him this winter, I was on a vacation with him on a uh, cruise ship, and I said, well, how many grand slams does that give you now for your career? He said, well, that would make it one. Base hit for Stocker, showing off some of that 300 hitter form from last year. Thompson stops at second. Danny Jackson comes up with a chance to help himself. This is what I'm talking about. Watch you just slap at the ball. See the ball's out there, just slaps it to left field. And you know, when you call a hitter a punch and judy hitter, that's not a derogatory statement. It's just a type of hitter that he is. And he just punches it to left field for a base hit. You can see it's very wet there in the outfield, ball bouncing, throwing water. Well, tonight, another phrase they used to use, which was kind of appropriate looking at that ball bouncing through the water out there, they used to call those type hitters spray hitters. Yeah, that was water spray, right? <laughs> On two out here is Danny Jackson. Now Jackson is not helpless up there. Jackson has a 219 batting average. He got more hits than any other Phillies pitcher. Seven for 32. He even has a double and he has two runs batted in. You know, I mentioned several times in our telecast that you know a hitter, a, a pitcher who is a good hitter will keep his average over 200, and that's good. That's like a hitter, a everyday player hitting 300. Jackson shows you that he's a good hitter. He has a 219 average. The curves are well. Tewksbury showed him uh, some respect there. He didn't throw that first ball fastball. Oh, and won the count. Jackson, by the way, he sort of had some newfound prowess at the plate this year. His lifetime average before this year, 113. And another breaking ball. Yeah, he reverts back to it when he sees the breaking ball. Hey, Joe, this guy looks like a punch and Judy hitter to me. <laughs> Maybe not even a, just a Judy. Oh, and 
to the count to Danny Jackson. Two on, two out, two strikes. One to one the score. Fastball off the outside. One ball, two strikes now. Jackson has gotten himself into the best shape of his career. Another thing Dalton was mentioning about it. This is a guy who's on a mission this year, Danny Jackson. In the dirt, he fouled it. Not a very good eye, but he made contact. Well, I was going to say, if Tewksbury throws him anything but a curveball here, I can see why he struggled his last few outings. He had him set up perfectly for this breaking ball down and away. He gets it down and away, and Jackson just barely gets a piece of it and stays alive. I don't think it should count as a foul ball if a guy swings at a pitch like that. <laughs> There's no Thompson at second base. Kevin Stocker at first. Both better to go at the crack of the bat, which so far hasn't seemed too likely. Well, a broken background at a short Ozzy. the fastball but right in the hands and at the cost of Jackson's back. One run with the Philly zone. Jukesbury will be coming up then Gilkey and Pena. It is one to one after two. Cardinals one, Phillies one. We go to the last of the fourth here at the vet. Bob Tewksbury on the hill for St. Louis. Facing Danny Jackson tonight. Pretty good matchup. We were talking about the Phillies and the problems they've had with their rotation. Jackson is the only one of the big five from last year that went to the World Series. Still pitching for the Phillies. There was the rotation last year. Schilling, Jackson, Rivera, Green, Mulholland. Only one of them. Green went on the disabled list and he was just there for the minimum 15 days. What a difference a year makes. Schilling, 0-7. Then on the DL, Rivera's been out for 37 days already. Green, 33. And, of course, Mulholland never did pitch for the Phillies this year. He was traded during the spring. Here is Eisenreich. And the curveball in there for a call strike. Eisenreich single to center and later scored the Phillies run in a 1-1 ball game. He's hitting 316 for the year. Eisenreich with a double. You know, Tewksbury has struggled in five of his last six outings he's lost. Well, part of the problem is they're kind of hitting them where they ain't, so to speak, as we Willie Keeler would say. That ball was hit off the end of the bat, and it just finds the foul line down the right field line. It's a curveball, completely fools Eisenreich, but he pops it up down the right field line, and look at that, he hits just inside the line, and it's a double. So he makes a good pitch, but he doesn't have anything to show for it except the runner at second with no one out. Now, Milt Thompson. Now, Milt bounced a single to center his first time. Batiste behind him. And look what he's done with men in scoring position this year. 4-69. But Joe, I mean, well, off the foot of Tewksbury and into left field. Tewksbury rolling around in the mound. Eisenreich scores, and Tewksbury immediately starts to run toward the dugout, the trainer there to meet him. It is two to one Philadelphia. Milt Thompson does it again. This one off the foot of Bob Tewksbury. Started running off the mound, Joe, after writhing in pain for a few moments. Well, I don't think Where he was could, he going? I don't think he could stand still, John. First, he started to go to back up home plate because there was a base hit with a runner at second. He's to go and back up home plate. But then he just continued to hop. It's a slider, and he lined it hard off the right outside of his. Looks like it hit him right on the right ankle. It's a low line drive. He doesn't have any chance to get out of the way. He actually tries to get his glove over, but he can't. Now, this is full speed the way it sounded. Now, as Eisenreich came in to score, he started to come to back up home plate, and then he just decided to keep strolling because I'm sure he couldn't just stand there and put pressure on it. But he says he's okay now, and he tells Joe Torre he's okay. Now, you know, I wouldn't have blamed him if he just sat there in the mound and waited for that guy to come out and administer to him, but he jumped up and started running back well, he's to back up the play. Do his job. 
Well, well you know what? It's more of a reaction. Good, he had a pretty good excuse, Joe. You're right, but that's more of a reaction. You, as from the time you're a little kid, you've been taught with a runner at second, you back up, and you just do it automatically. And then the pain set in about halfway, I think. I mean, this was not one of those, well, I didn't back up home plate because my car stalled. I mean, he got hit on the ankle with a ball about 400 miles an hour. But he does seem to be okay, so that's the important thing. I hope so. That's the, uh, the ankle attached to the foot with which he pushes off the slam. Matisse, the pitch out, but uh, Thompson was not running. Well, he's still hobbling out there a little bit. And you obviously you have to be careful if something's bothering you, you will change the way you to extend through your pitching motion and you may cause injury to some other part of your body. Well, Dizzy Dean actually right. was in the All-Star game, got hit in the foot. Broken toe, right? Yeah. And uh, then he kept pitching and it did change his delivery to compensate. And it hurt his arm and that was the end of old Diz uh, pretty much as an effective pitcher for the Cardinals. Know that better than anybody. The dangers of pitching uh, with an injury. Two and zero the count. Dizzy Dean, a 30-game winner, the last 30-game winner in the history of the National League, 60 years ago this year with the fabled Gas House Gang, 1934. Well, Tewksbury in his last 16 innings, John, has allowed 37 hits last 16 and two-thirds inning, so he's been getting tagged recently. Shallow right center, base hit. Thompson heading for third. Three straight hits for the Phillies here in the fourth inning. Nobody out. One thing about the Phillies, they are taking advantage of this wet field. It's probably because they're more accustomed to playing on the wet field than the Cardinals are. Well, Joe Torre is heading out to the bound now. He's got uh, somebody up in his bullpen. And uh, we'll see here. They're going in with the umpire out. Meanwhile, for those of you just joining us from the uh, basketball game, this is ESPN Sunday Night Baseball, the National League champion Phillies here uh, at the bat. And they have just gone ahead of the Cardinals, 2-1, to one, on the Milt Thompson single off the ankle of that man, Bob Tewksbury. He stayed in for one batter more. And Batiste then singled into shallow right center. And you see Tewksbury limping noticeably as he walks off the hill. And Brian Eversgird will come on in relief. The uh, the play, Milt Thompson after a double by Eisenreich. And he hit it right back at Tewksbury. Right off the ankle. A new, new pitcher's coming on. All right. Cone still drawing ever closer to number 10 there. Here. Phillies 2, Cardinals 1. And the new pitcher, Brian Eversgird, has come on for the Cardinals in place of the injured Bob Tewksbury. Eversgird out of uh, Kaskaskia College. Played there for three years, Joe. Yeah, and I, I actually heard of that. I've heard of that college one other no, time. No, you haven't. Yeah, I, I have, John. One other time. <laughs> what was the other time? Mm, probably about 15 years ago. Yeah, well, well, yeah that, that year you had amnesia. <laughs> Here's Brian Eversgird. He's from Centralia, Illinois, 6'1", 190 pounds, 25 years of age, making his way through the Cardinal system. 1989, he led the Kaskaskia College to a sectional championship. Through 17 innings in three days, Joe. Well, here's that uh, ball off the ankle again, hit by Milt Thompson. Look where it ended up. I mean, that one, that really hit him squarely. Well, it ended up in left field, and Tewksbury, you can see, he's in a lot of pain right there, but he wanted to stay in the ball game. Well, and then he got up and ran behind the plate. Yeah. But he's walking off, and you can see he doesn't want to put much pressure on that right ankle. 
Next Sunday night, we'll see the Phillies again, this time up in Montreal. The Expos, the front runner for the wild card spot right now, but also battling the Braves for first. Led by Moise Salou, who is hitting 356. Dykstra and the Phillies, they had to hold off the Expos late last year. Now they're trying to catch them. Eight Eastern, five Pacific from Le Stade Olympique and Montreal next Sunday night. Well, here's Kevin Stocker now. Runners at first and third. Nobody out. One run is already in. Stocker already with a hit tonight. And he's got another one off the glove of Zeal. Coming in to score is Thompson. Stopping at second is Batiste. That's four consecutive hits in the inning. Stocker is two for two. Three one Phillies. Well, Evans Gerd's first pitch is a high fastball, and Stocker jumps right on it and lines it over the head of the third base, almost right off the tip of Zeal's glove. He almost came down with it, and if he would have, he would have had a double play because Thompson was way off the bag at third. Well, I think everybody in America thinks that uh, Jackson's bunting here, Joe. Well, they're going in to talk to Everett Gerd because he's probably not familiar with the signs that they're going to use or try to use here on whether they're going to put the rotation play on. So he wants to make sure that he knows that Jackson has had four sacrifice bunts this year. Round to the shortstop in his first at bat tonight. The first base side. Nicely done. Evers Gerd to Jeffries. The runners have advanced. Batiste to third. Stocker to second. Well, I'll say this. After the conversation, they still got it wrong. Zill was charging. Ozzy Smith was not going any place. Usually if the third baseman charges, the shortstop will go over to cover third. Now watch, Zeal is charging, and nothing else is going on. Ozzie Smith is not moving, so they still were not in sync on what was supposed to happen with that play. Second and third, Batiste at third, Stocker at second. The infield pulled in at the corners. The curveball from Eversgrid. See much higher uh, Jugs gun readings with Eversgrid than you saw with Tewksbury. The off-speed pitch, so they're deep at shortstop and second. Smith and uh, Pena, respectively, but pulled in at the corners. Zeal at third and Jeffries at first. To Jeffries, he's going to go home. It's not a bad play by the Cardinals defensively. This is a good base running play by Batista. They're obviously going on contact, so as soon as the ball is hit, he takes off for the plate. McGriff tried to block the play, but he couldn't. Right there, he's going immediately. Jeffries comes down, fires to the plate. He just beats it. So you have to give the base runner credit there. Before McGriff can get back for the tag, Batista's foot is already across the base. Good play there by the Phillies. So a fielder's choice and a run battered in for Dykstra. Here is Mickey Morandini. They've got some uh, things that could happen here, Joe. Dykstra's a, a very fine base dealer at first. Stocker's got pretty good speed at third. Cardinals have to decide what they're going to do if Dykstra runs. And the guy's pretty handy with the bat. Morandini at the plane. Only one out. Popped him out. This is Ozzie Smith. And that is out number two. Morandini now 0 for 2 with a sacrifice bunt. Stocker had a hold of third. Dykstra hanging uh, tight at first. And that will bring up John Cruck. Bob Tewksbury charged with all three of the runs in this inning. And the book is not closed on him. He gave up four runs and seven hits in his three-plus innings. Strike one to Crook. He's grounded a second, grounded a first. 
Phillies leading the Cardinals here in the fourth inning. That's the way they did it last year. The Phillies getting production from up and down the lineup. But the other good thing that they've done today is they've had good base running from all parts of the lineup, from the top to the bottom, to run the base as well, and that's important. strike. Brian Eversger facing John Crook. Dalton would be next. Two down, two on. Crook, the eighth batter of the inning. Smith will be coming up five to one Phillies. Five to one Phillies over the Cardinals. Greg Jeffries coming up. We talked to him about whether he's in a good groove at the plate right now or not. It just seems like my timing's off a little bit right now. Uh, and the lucky thing is I'm scrapping a hit here and there, you know, so I'm still kind of lingering around uh, until I start feeling really good to play it again. And, and I'll know when I feel really good because I feel like I just wait back to wait as long as I can and pretty much do what I want to do with the ball. But there's times where you feel like, you know, you can't really react uh, correctly. He's hitting 329, so that's not too bad for a guy scuffling, huh? Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> Because I, as they say, so how soon we forget. I can remember when he would have been very happy to be hitting 300. But last year, his first with the Cardinals, he hit 342. And, of course, that's what was forecast for him when he first came up with the Mets. People just assumed that he would do that every year. Of course, with the Mets, he didn't. He hit 258, 283, 272. But this trade to the Cardinals seemed to be the, really the best thing that ever happened to Jeffrey. It was a great ballpark for him. Great surroundings. He and Todd Zeal have become uh, fast friends, both on and off the field. Well, the first time I saw him with the Mets, I thought he was going to be a good hitter. And he had a good playoff season as a rookie. I mean, he was swinging the bat very well. He's always been projected to be a guy that could hit well over 300. And now he seems to be well on his way of putting three or four 300 seasons together. This is I got it, I got it. Waves catching away. And there is one man gone in the sixth inning. It's a good pitch from Jackson. He gets the ball away. Now watch how Jeffries kind of reaches for it. See, he's reaching out there because he was fooled on it. He was probably looking for something off speed, and it was a fastball tailing away. And he just slapped at it and hit a ground ball to first base. Jackson is doing a great job of keeping these hitters off balance, not so much with the change of speeds, but in and out. Well, here's Todd Zeal, and here's a guy who really is scuffling. 233. improved dramatically over third base. He's only made four errors so far this year. He 33 last year. But now, where's the offense? Where's the beef? 103 runs batted in a year ago. So that was the same type of swing Jeffries had. He first pitched him and threw him a fastball inside. Then he went away with a fastball. And all Todd Zeal could do was just slap at it. So 
Jackson's keeping him off balance. Now back inside. So he's moving the ball around very well, and that's one of the reasons that the Cardinals only have the five base hits in this game. One ball and two strikes to Zeal. One away, nobody on, sixth inning. There's a drive down the left field line. Zeal got a fastball up and out over the plate, and he drills it. This pitch is not in and it's not away. It's out over the plate, and he drills it. Thompson gets a good jump on it. Now watch this catch. Perfect timing, and he comes down with it. Two down and nobody on. Milt Thompson. Man, what a play. Ball one. Witten has twice struck out on pitches similar to that one. Sliders. Ironically, the only two strikeouts Jackson has recorded in the game. He's ahead five to one. Right field, deep. Eyes and right. Go on, a home run. <laughs> well, it really helps to be strong, doesn't it? Because he was, I said before, he was late on the fastball and ahead on the curveball. And this is a fastball. He's late on it, and it just looks like he has a flat-footed swing. But he's so strong, he hits it over the right field wall. Five to two, the fifth home run of the year for Mark Whitten. He had been one for 21 before this one. Now watch the pitch. It's a fastball away, and see how he's flat-footed. Now watch. There's nothing in this but arms. He's just so strong that he's able to hit it out of the ballpark. He didn't get any leg drive or any turn. It was just all arms. Now, Brian Jordan hit a foul ball into the crowd. Well, I guess a guy who hits four homers and has 12 RBIs in a single game. I guess he can leap tall buildings with a single bound. There's a high fly ball. This will stay in the park. Dykstra. And that's the inning. Jordan now one for three. Run for the Cardinals. It is five to two. We head to the last of the sixth inning. We'll be back. National League champion Philadelphia five. The Cardinals two on Sunday night baseball. Now Tuesday night, Pablo Bure and the Vancouver Canucks head to New York, New York to face Mark Messier and the Rangers. And one team with a date with destiny there, 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. The Canucks have never won the Cup, and the Rangers have not won it in 54 years. Coverage begins with a preview at 7.30, then the game, the opening face-off at 8 Eastern, 5 Pacific. The Canucks and the Rangers for the Stanley Cup. New pitcher for the Cardinals, John Habian. He's come on now in relief of Rob Murphy, who went one perfect inning. And Habian, look how many games he's been in. The Cardinals are playing their 59th game, and Habian is making his 32nd appearance. Murphy made his 30th. This has been the busiest bullpen in the National League. Starting pitch, he's not been that very strong, and they've made more appearances and pitched more innings than any other bullpen. Jim Eisenreich, a single, a double, two runs scored. He started each of the Philly rallies. That's a ball. One ball and one strike to Eisenreich. He'll be followed by Milt Thompson and Kim Batiste. These have really been the big men tonight for the Phillies in the lineup. Eisenreich, Thompson, Batiste, and Stocker. They've had nine hits, and they've given uh, this man, Danny Jackson, more than enough offense take him into the last of the eighth inning, a hit by three. Meanwhile, the Phillies closer, Doug Jones, has started warming up in the bullpen. Speaking of Philly closers, you know, last year at this time, it was Mitch Williams, and I read an article that Bob Watson had made the comment that if Mitch Williams was more adaptable, he'd still be with the Astros. He said Mitch Williams only wanted the ball in the ninth inning with the game on the line, and they couldn't afford to continue to do that. So there's another base hit for Eisenreich, his third of the game. It's skipping across the turn. Eisenreich heading for second. It's perfect. 
perfect against right-handed pitching tonight. He had that one at bat against Eversgard where he popped up, but he's had two doubles and a single, and all of them off of the pitches out over the plate. He liked the ball out over the plate. That pitch was down and out over the plate. Nice play in center field by Jordan to cut it off and keep it from going to the wall, but he can't hold Eisenreich to a single. Eisenreich hustling all the way, goes in with a double. And here is Milt Thompson now. He also has had two hits up till now. Two singles, a run battered in. Thompson, who uh, played for a few years with the Cardinals, 1989 through 92, and hit 290 or better in three of his four years there. Just a guy who never really has had the everyday job, but he's been a real important man on, on a ball club, both with the Phillies and with the Cardinals. Oh, that's a foul ball. And you can see Milt Thompson trying to pull the ball to the right side. there uh, a moment ago on the update the final score from Texas of the game which we were watching earlier while we were in the rain delay here the Kansas City Royals defeated Texas seven to two and David Cohn is the first 10 game winner in the American League a few hours after Greg Maddox became the Major League's first 10 game winner Cohn went seven and two third innings gave up no earned runs three hits two unearned runs scored against him. he is 10 and 2 for Hal McRae's Royals last year he was 11 and 14 for the whole year he might do a little better this year no Thompson inside two and two to count these guys this part of the order Eisenreich Thompson Batiste Stocker hitting numbers five through eight in the order have had eight of the Phillies 10 hits they've scored all of the runs goes Milt Thompson for the uh, first Habian strikeout. One away, Eisenreich still at second. Kim Batiste coming up. He's one for two with a run battered in and a sacrifice fly. Kim Batiste. Last year, uh, he became, I guess, rather infamous. He became famous in a way he didn't want to be. Using him as a late inning defensive replacement at third base in the league championship series against Atlanta, putting him in there for Dave Hollins. And he kept picking errors after they brought him in. And he's had a hard time of it so far this year with Hollins now on the disabled list. Batiste has made six errors, only driven in seven. comes back there's talk of putting him in the outfield now figure he's better off in the outfield than playing third base chase the high fastball and didn't get it one ball and two strike one ball and one strike to Batiste this was game one of the league championship series uh oh Batiste in the game five Rod Gant hits one to him None of those cost the Phillies a loss, you know, to lose the game. They bounced back very well in those ball games. And Mitch Wiggins was one put in trouble in one of the ball games, so he pitched out of the jam. One ball and two strikes now to Kim Batiste. Sports Center, right after the ball game, Sunday conversation with Jack Nicholas. The Rockets and the Knicks, game three highlights. And the Braves and the Astros, Greg Maddox, one number 10 today. And all of the baseball highlights. The Minnesota Twins, they swept the White Sox this weekend at the Metrodome. Jeez, chased it. And it's another strikeout for Habian. Two down here in the eighth inning. Stocker coming up. Big breaking ball from Habian. And Batiste just chases it. You can see it's breaking wide of the plate. And that's an ugly swing right there. <laughs> Even with two strikes. <laughs> but it looked ugly when it pitches two feet outside. Yeah. Well, they're going to walk Stocker, who is two for three tonight. And uh, But Danny Jackson is not out on deck. Instead, it is Tony Longmire. 
So Jackson is finished for the night with Jones getting ready in the bullpen. Jackson wearing his jacket. Back in the dugout. There he is. Well, eight strong innings for Jackson tonight. Gave up eight hits. Did he really spread them out? Give up two hits in the first inning and never more than one hit in any inning after that. And uh, this guy who used to have so many problems with his control walked only one batter. Well, he has been pitching very well lately. And, and what happens again is with that new pitch, the changeup, you get hitters swinging at more bad pitches than before. If you can add a third pitch to your repertoire, you'll get more people swinging at another pitch, chasing it out of the strike zone. You don't have to throw as many strikes. Now, Johnny Padres, the pitching coach for the Phillies, he had one of the great changeups that anybody ever saw in his days with the, the Dodgers in Brooklyn and in L.A. and is a great teacher of same. I swung in one of Padres' changeups about three times one day, all on the same pitch. He had such great, great motion. Now, did you get the golden sombrero that day? No, because I didn't strike out. I just swung at that one pitch three times. They can only call it one strike. Well, if they thought of it, they could. They might have given you the sombrero for that. Great changeup. Catcher McGriff kept the ball out in front, and he'd be in retrieval. Two men on, two men out of the eighth inning. The Phillies lead five to two. The Cardinals ninth inning featuring Brian Jordan, Terry McGriff, and Ozzie Smith. At least those are the do-ups. However, on the bench, they've got Ray Lankford, a left-handed hitter, and Gerald Perry, a left-handed hitter. We might see both of them with the right-handed Doug Jones getting ready to come in. Lankford not being in the lineup tonight. And we haven't had much of a chance to talk about him. What a year he's having. center field. That one is way back there. It will go to the wall. Eisenreich scores. Here comes Stocker. He scores. A double for Longmire. Seven to two fills. Joe Torre probably thought Jim Fregosi may have been bluffing when he had Doug Jones warming up, and he did not think that they were going to pinch hit for Jackson. This pitch is out over the plate. He turns on it, hits it hard in the left center field, and it bounces off the wall. The Phillies get a break that it did not bounce over the wall. There's a high drive by Dykstra down the right field line. Into the corner. Well, I don't know either. I guess it's a foul ball. He did not catch it. Foul ball. Since everyone's remaining on the field, we'll assume it was a foul ball. Now we take a look at Witten down in the corner trying to make the catch. He leaps and he can't come down with it. It's over the fence there down the right field line. Was, uh, that was starting to become a, a great mystery there, Joe. Well, there was no signal from the umpire. Glenn Dykstra, one for four in the game with a run battered in. One strike, seven to two. The Phillies now. Longmire with a pinch hit double. Longmire, at one point considered a great prospect of the Phillies farm system. Runs well, pretty good bat. He's now five for 17 as a pinch hitter. Now Doug Jones has taken a seat in that Phillies uh, bullpen. Change up misses from Haven. And Heathcliff Slocum is back up out there. So yeah. this is no longer a save situation. So they may not want to use Jones anymore. Right, it's not a save situation. With a five-run lead, Jones could not come into the game in the ninth inning and get a save. I guess they're saying that with a five-run lead, you can go down and pitch and hold the lead, right? Yeah, I could be the setup man. Yeah. I could throw oh, my get a hold, right? I'd throw my circle change. <laughs> Glenn Dykstra. He's a leadoff man, but he is second in the league in extra base hits. You know, he's hit 25 doubles this year. Three triples, five homers. Into right center. Witten going back. He's there. And that's the inning. Two runs. 
runs against Habian. We go to the ninth inning. Last chance for the Cardinals. But now they're down by five. Seven to two, Philadelphia. Sunday night baseball from the vet and for the Phillies and their fans. It's like old times, like 1993. Doing it all beautifully. Great defense, timely hitting. That's the uh, MetLife blimp. Aerial shots of Veterans Stadium. The surrounding area being provided by the MetLife blimp. Snoopy One, MetLife's aerial ambassador, typically cruises at an altitude of 1,200 feet and a speed of 35 miles per hour. Kind of a lot like driving with Joe Morgan. <laughs> Heathcliff Slocum. He's been a big man out of that Philly bullpen. Yeah, really. both, both he and Doug Jones have done a tremendous job for the Phillies, especially, you know, due to the fact that their starting pitching has not pitched as well as they expected. Well, with a 7-2 ball game now, here's Brian Jordan. He'll swing for himself here, one for three in the game. Gerald Perry, though, has come out of the on-deck circle. And the Cardinals pinch hitter deluxe the last couple of years, Gerald Perry. Jordan singled back in the fourth inning and has twice flied out to Dykstra. How's this one back? Oh, and one. That's one of the uh, message boards here at Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah. Sports Center is next. Center dream highlight. They have Sports Center next with the theme on the message board at the event. I bet that was it, Joe. Somebody's dream came true tonight. One ball and two strikes to Brian Jordan. Keith Oberman and uh, Mike Tarico standing by tonight. Busy to work Sports Center tonight. Brian Jordan in the ninth inning. One of the folks have started to head home here from the vet. Great crowd here. Strike three call to the inside corner. That's not what Jordan thought. Jerry Crawford gets an ear full from Jordan. Now a pinch hitter will come up. Take a look and let you be the judge. Of course, Jordan thought the ball was inside. Crawford said no. Here's Gerald Perry. And that's a ball, Perry. Six for 21 as a pinch hitter this year, 286 average. Seven runs battered in in that role. A mean looking pitch. Dipping down like a like a fork ball. One strike to Perry. Luis Alisea has come out on deck. Down the left field line. Base hit to the wall. Thompson has to give chase. And Perry has his seventh pinch hit of the year. I tell you what, Perry's just like his cousin Dan Breeson, who played for the Reds. He can hit. Fastball up and out over the plate, and he just rips it down the left field line. And watch, it's a fastball up and away, and he lines it down the left field line. Good hitters do that. And he has himself a double, as you can see. Good hitting there by Perry, but again, he's a good hitter. He's been a good hitter for a long time. That's his 79th career pinch hit. Last year, Perry had 24 pinch hits for the Cardinals, 24 for 70. This is Luis Alisea pinch hitting for Ozzie Smith. Alisea had a home run the other night as a pinch hitter. Three run shot. We're in the ninth inning here, the vent. Ozzie Smith, by the way, went two for three tonight. There's Ray Lankford. He's come out on deck to bat for Habian. One out. Second here in the ninth inning. Heathcliff Slocum trying to wrap it up for Danny Jackson. Throwing about 192 miles an hour with that fast. 
fastball. 3 0 the count to Alisea. Hitting only 231 overall. Although amazingly, well, Alisea's had 105 at bats for the whole year. Hitting only 231, but he has five triples. Playing the spacious Bush Stadium. That part was built for triples. It wasn't really built for a lot of home runs. They're going to take the turf out of Bush Stadium. Was it next year or the year after? And also uh, Kaufman Stadium in Kansas City. Minus turf beginning next year. That's a strike. Three and two now to Ali Sands. He's a switch hitter. Heathcliff. Slocum from uh, Jamaica, New York. Which is in uh, New York City. Fly ball to center. Dykstra. Number two. 48,682. The paid crowd tonight at the vet. Great crowd. The Phillies struggling. They reached a million this year in their home attendance at the earliest date in the history of the franchise. And tonight they passed 1.2 million in their home attendance. The average crowd here this year has been better than 37,000. Well, here's Ray Lankford. I had a chance to see Bill Giles, one of the owners of the Phillies. And Bill and I started in this game together a long time ago with the Houston Colt 45. been the Cardinals big hitter this year 291 13 homers 32 batted in you remember when we opened the season with the major league opener at Cincinnati way back on April the 2nd Ray Langford was the first hitter of this season and he hit a home run to start the season off against Jose Rio and we should have known that was a forecast of things to come a lot of home runs this year 93 miles an hour on that last fastball well, now Dalton goes out to talk to uh, Slocum after that pitch. The crowd now rising to its feet all around Veterans Stadium. Hoping to uh, bring this one to a conclusion. Pacific. We'll see you then. Final score tonight, 7-2. The Phillies, Danny Jackson wins it. He's 8-1. Sports Center coming up next. John Miller for Joe Morgan saying good night, everyone.